Uh, hello, hi there all. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, living legend uh, Robert Kuta uh, with us uh, here in California, Berkeley. Uh, and uh, this is a special occasion uh, which we all will cherish in posterity that uh, his book, a very celebrated book which he co-authored with uh, Hans von Schaffer uh, professor, uh, emeritus professor, and a, a German scholar, European scholar, uh, in a book known as Solomon, not how law can reduce the poverty of nations. And that's a wonderful book, being a lawyer in Supreme Court of India. I'm, I'm very Ranjan Pandey with Bob Kuter, which popularly, popularly we know him with love, uh, Robert Kuter, uh, professor. Uh, I would like to know uh, about that the book, uh, and, uh, which is coming in a Hindi translation, uh, and uh, it is going to be released here in, in this conference. Uh, how that idea crack uh, to your mind? Uh, rather, I'll say uh, both of your mind, because we miss yes. really Professor Schaffer here. If he would have been with us, then yes. that would be a wonderful equation. Yes. But uh, uh, it comes from two continents: uh, one is European, and then one American. And uh, we have much uh, doctrinal thinking in uh, European uh, way of doing law. And uh, here we, people are doing law in, in economics. And poverty is a common phenomenon around all the world. Somewhere, sometimes it is bigger, something is apparent, yes. evident, and sometimes it's a hidden one. So I would really like to know that uh, how that idea of uh, law can reduce the poverty of the nation crack to your minds, both of your minds. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you asked. I, I have a passion for my subject, and so you're liberating my feelings when you ask me to talk about them. Uh, before I start, I want to thank you very much for translating uh, this book. Uh, India is the uh, largest democracy in the world, in one of the largest nations of the world, and Hindi is an official language. And it's a great honor to have this work translated into Hindi and made available to India. You know, India and the United States uh, have something in common. We were both colonized by the British. Ooh. <laughs> and when the British soldiers left, their law stayed. And so we both have the common law and also democracy as a part of our heritage. And this builds a special relationship, I think, um, in our legal communities. Law and economics is a wonderful subject because if you, you, if you study law in one country as opposed to another, it's pretty different. But if you study economics, it's the same. Yes. So when you put the two together, you have a subject that travels very well across boundaries. And because of your work, I hope that law and economics will travel very well to India. Yes, we hope so, and uh, we keep our finger crossed. Uh, but again... Uh, now, now, let me, re let me answer your question. Yes, no. yes, yes, yes. The question is... Uh, How that idea crack to your mind, both of you? Why, why Solomon's not? Well, uh, sometimes I, I like to say that I'm like the Roman Catholic priest, who was okay. an old older man and one day he sat up in bed and he thought maybe Buddha was right. Oh, sounds okay. interesting. <laughs> because uh, I spent most of my life doing the analysis of the efficiency of laws. When I discovered this methodology, I fell in love with it. But as time went by, I began to realize that it was not efficiency but growth that solves the problem of poverty. Um, if your economy grows at 2% a year for 100 years, roughly what's happened in the United States, uh, you get uh, an increase of six to seven times. Seven times. But if it grows at 10% a year, you get an increase of 14,000 times. That is the case with that's, China. That's, that's the case with China. China. And when you go to China, you see it. Yes, exactly. Uh, I went there in the 1990s, and then I went, I went there in 1994, and then 2004, and I, I didn't know where I was when I got off the airplane the second time. It's a different world. 
If you have that kind of growth, it will transform uh, your society materially and um, it will have deep effects on your culture. Yes, I see. You know, poverty, uh, for most people, poverty is uh, not a curse, it's a great inconvenience. For some people, it's a curse. It's a curse. And the addressing the problem of poverty is one of the great tasks of this new century. So I realized that I was like the uh, Catholic priest who said, baby Buddha was right. I sat up in bed and I said, why am I doing all these efficiency analyses? I should do growth. I should figure out what makes an economy grow because that's what makes a nation prosperous. So the other thing that influenced me was this. I had studied um, economics, uh, have a PhD in economics at Harvard, and there I learned the efficiency studies very well as they apply to industrial organization. <clears throat> but I also started a business. Okay, here in, nice here in California. Yeah, this is left of all. This is if you don't have your own dot com in California, you feel you're left out. Oh, <laughs> so, so I, I started a dot com, and uh, it's been quite successful. It's called the Berkeley Electronic Press, and the Berkeley Electronic Press has done well commercially, but it's also taught me so much, because it was at the Berkeley Electronic Press that I saw the problem of Solomon's knot. Okay, because okay. Solomon's knot is a knot that you can see uh, on the uh, on a fishing boat yes. or maybe on a Roman tile, an ancient yes. Roman tile, Roman tiles. and it's a way of tying together two loops very yes. tightly yes. so they hold. And those two loops are new ideas and capital. It's, yes. it's, it's the st what happens in a startup firm. The new idea is brought together with finance. And it was through the experience of trying to do that that I realized how important law is to it. Without good law, it's very difficult, maybe impossible. Uh, so that gave me the idea of the central image in Solomon's Knot. And then if there was my dear friend, of course, my co-author, Bernd Schaefer, because Berndt is not only the father of German law and economics, exactly true he's also comes to law and economics having first done development economics, especially in India, where he wrote his dissertation. Yeah, he has done very well in India. Yeah. So, I mean, I was thinking about the ideas, and I have this occasion to work with this great, great friend, this great man from Germany, and that's where the book came from. Wonderful, 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 wonderful to hear you have that idea crack. Uh, you see, Professor, uh, and the law and economics uh, is developed with a small paper of one of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the thought was uh, very well cherished in uh, Adam Ed Smith's work mm -hmm. and uh, at the Wealth of Nation and uh, earlier writing there, mm -hmm. was, there was a hint that uh, law and economics has uh, some close Solomon not uh, uh, in their relationship which mm -hmm. needs to be explored. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that uh, paper of Corsi mm -hmm. and uh, Calabresi like mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you are the living legend who has seen all the doing uh, from that part uh, of initial days to, uh, until now it's uh, almost uh, 30 decades past, uh, 40, mm -hmm. 30, 40 decades past. And uh, you have seen uh, many countries growing in their economy also. Mm -hmm. Many countries are doing so well and many countries are not performing so well. Mm -hmm. And poverty is uh, economic disparagement mm -hmm. and uh, many problems are there cropping up uh, where uh, law has to answer. Mm -hmm. But the doctrinal law has an issue with uh, more to do with the idea of justice. Mm -hmm. uh, idea of uh, veil orderness mm -hmm. and uh, when the matters eventually lend to the court uh, uh, ordinarily judges say uh, let us know what the law is mm -hmm. so uh, the, we have a uh, normative and policy considerations uh, uh, suggestions in law mm -hmm. and economics mm -hmm. but uh, is it uh, now that is something to do with uh, it's a high time uh, to see the, what can be with the judges and the court uh, do, doing in the law and economics so how you see entire phenomena in your entire uh, career 
right from that course uh, and you are particularly yes, you are yes, writing yes. that uh, a very special textbook uh, law in economics which you uh, write with your co-author and which is a, a bible book of uh, yeah, uh, thank you for, 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 for all this uh, undergraduate postgraduate uh, yeah. research uh, scholars so to kindly uh, elaborate that the, the entire phenomenon yeah. uh, in last years of law and economics uh, <coughs> across the country line yes well uh, a senior scholar in law and economics in my generation is someone who could remember its history. I don't have to study its history, I remember it. I, mean, I was at the first meeting of the Law and Economics Association in the United States when it was founded. Um, I was, uh, and I was a founding direc director of it. The same is true of the Latin American Law and Economics Association. Um, and I have known the great figures who are a little bit older than me like uh, Ronald Coase um, and Richard Posner, Guido Calabresi, Henry Manny, knew all these people and I participated with them. Uh, so when I think of the subject I'm remembering, and I'm remembering it from my own point of view. Uh, now, uh, I want to say that I love law and economics. I don't just like it, I love it. And I began my career as an economist in public finance, which is another name for the economics of the public sector. And I didn't love it. I liked it. That's not enough. Uh, if you want to be a professor and you want to contribute, you should think first of your subject when you get up in the morning and last when you go to bed at night. And that's been true of me in law and economics for over 40 years. Uh, so I love the subject for its own sake, but I also have come to appreciate that many traditions of legal theory are impractical. And what I mean by that is that the ideas of the theory of the law that are taught in the university do not reach down to the practical level at which judges have to decide cases and lawyers have to argue cases. There's a big gap between the theory and the law itself. And the beauty of law and economics is that that gap is much smaller and begins to disappear entirely. That is to say, law and economics theory is becoming part of the law. This, I see this in my generation. I see this going on. And that was always our goal when we started the Law and Economics Associations. We would like for law and economics, in a sense, to die. It should disappear. It should just become legal theory. Okay. Now, I can explain at some length why it's practical, why it works, but I, first of all, I just want to assure you how true this is. Uh, for example, I told you I started a business that was a successful startup. Law and economics was enormous help for me. When you start a business, you have no contracts. You don't have a corporate form. You don't have a tax strategy, how you're going to minimize the tax liability that you're going to bear. And all of these involve the strategic decisions of a business interacting with the law, interacting with various bodies of law. So for me, it was a greatly practical in starting a business. And I also think that it's greatly practical at the level of legal principles that are deciding in the courts. Because some people think that uh, principles of law are, are like principles, principles of morality. They have a kind of obviousness if you think about it, if you'll just consider it. You'll see what's right and wrong and you'll know what to do. But the law is not like that in many, many times. It's much more instrumental and it, it's trying to accomplish something like help businessmen to organize a corporation, help a person to write his will so that he gets, his heirs get what he wants them to get. Help the court decide what powers the parliament has as opposed to the president or the prime minister. Those are questions where the consequences matter. You have to figure out what the consequences are. And law and economics is a great theory for figuring out the consequences in very, of very practical situations. So 
the theory itself becomes much more useful than, say, the philosophy of law, which I like the philosophy of law, but it's not very useful. It's not, it's not something that the judges can actually decide a case on or the but lawyers can point. argue a case on. I think the consequences are, are always important. So I felt when I found law and economics, I discovered a kind of key to law and government that was missing somehow, that I read political theory and political philosophy and moral theory and moral philosophy and read law. and. Still, there was something that was not there, not and there. that I seemed to find in law and economics. Now, with that passion that I have, I've traveled the world a lot, and I've talked about law and economics in a lot of countries. Uh, and one of the things I've observed is that in some places it's taken root and really grown, in other places it hasn't. And if you ask me why, I couldn't tell you why. It's complicated. It's like history. You know, in history, there's no one thing that causes something else. There's a lot of things. But interwoven, interwoven. You know, in terms of statistics, it's uh, history is a multivariable equation, not a single variable equation. So, for example, in South America, one of the strongest traditions in law and economics is in Peru. Why Peru? Well, I don't know. I mean, I can name a few great people who are partly responsible for it, but it's a lot of things. And the subject has really worked there. Now it seems to be taking off in Brazil. It's quite remarkable. I, maybe it, I have a student there, maybe she's part of the cause. I, but it, it it's taken root. I don't know why. In, in Mexico, the person, if an election were held today, the person who would win as president of Mexico probably is a person who was at the founding of the Mexican Law and Economics Association with my student and me. Uh, sometimes it just takes. And then there are other places that disappoint you. For example, I studied in England for three years. That's where I studied the philosophy of law. And the right I, place to study the philosophy of oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I was at Oxford, and uh, Oxford has had some <laughs> great philosophers. I love the place. But I imagined that law and economics would take there. I would imagine that that philosophical tradition could be combined with economics in a way that would be very fruitful. And I've been disappointed. The uh, place of law and economics in the at Oxford barely exists. Uh, professor, I have the one question comes to my mind naturally, as you know much about the philosophy of law also. Mm -hmm. uh, ordinarily, the economics which we have, the consequentialist mm -hmm. approach, mm -hmm. um, rather than the doctrinal um, mm -hmm. approach, we do the empirical research uh, where, mm -hmm. where we have many times surprising results mm -hmm. which we never thought of in a doctrinal yes. way. Yes, and uh, if with uh, with change of a perspective to revise our doctrines also in uh, yes. our thinking. Yes, and it has uh, something uh, close to uh, close with utility. Utility. Yes. So the, I, I may I may I may recall the very 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 cherished and renowned writing of Bentham uh, yes. about the, the theory of legislation and how yes. he talks about the efficiency issues and all that. Mm -hmm. But that all philosophy something to do with the uh, uh, philosophy of utilitarianism. Mm -hmm. uh, so you so so we can safely say that uh, it is law in economics, uh, which is uh, having uh, all philosophy of uh, utilitarianism, mm -hmm. or it is all utilitarianism only. Mm -hmm. so how you see it, uh, uh, it because lot of effort. Uh, I can see uh, in the uh, many PhD theses and uh, working papers in uh, European uh, scholars mm -hmm. that they are trying to find out some philosophical foundation for law and economics so they can in a nutshell tell the lawyers and the judges you see this is law in economics is all about uh, but I feel that a lot of uh, lot of uh, phenomena is going to out of it also so how you how you describe this uh, how you describe it? well <coughs> Uh, law and economics uh, often has found itself trying to penetrate a legal tradition in which the abstract theory, the general theory, is very philosophical. 
This is common. And uh, that has results in certain characteristics. Um, one is that uh, philosophers uh, don't understand that economics is a social science and not a philosophy. That's to say, nobody thinks that what's taught in the economics department is just an application of the philosophy of Bentham. It has a relationship to the philosophy of Bentham, but it is social science. It is not philosophy. Uh, and this, the mistake to think that law and economics is just utilitarian philosophy is a very attractive mistake because philosophers think they know what's wrong with, with utilitarianism. They think they know what its limits are yes. and uh, they think they know why at the fundamental level it's incorrect. And so they imagine that they can refute law and economics or dismiss law and economics without ever actually studying it. And that would be that would be very satisfying if it were possible because then you could go on doing the philosophy of law that you enjoy and you wouldn't have to wrestle with this new material. But the fact of the matter is law and, econ law, law and economics is a combination of law, a humanistic discipline, and a social science, economics. It is not a philosophy. So what is the connection then between utilitarianism and the social science. Uh, shall I talk about that? Yes, certainly. We love to hear yeah. that okay. from All you right. because this is, a, this is a recent talk in the world which is going on the, among the philosopher of law and economics and the scientists of law and economics. <coughs> well, uh, one of the characteristics of economics is that uh, something I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation is that when you drive across the border from Germany to France, there are important changes in the law. But economics is the same. Yes. You take a class in micro theory in Germany, you take a class in micro theory in France, it's going to be the same. Principles are the same. Probably you use the same books. The same books. Yeah. Law? No. It's going to be different. You're preparing for a different bar. There's a lot of different traditions. So the. Um, Economics itself has got to be consistent with a lot of different philosophies. See, in order for the social science to be a sufficiently neutral tool that it can be used in different countries and it can be used by different political parties in the same country, it's got to have a kind of core of philosophical neutrality. That is to say, you can be a utilitarian or you can be an anti-utilitarian and you can still be a law and economics scholar. Uh, one of the most famous, certainly the most notorious among economics, uh, law and economics scholars is Richard Posner, very great genius whom I admire a great deal. Uh, Richard Posner uh, has attacked Bentham and written as an anti-utilitarian. He's anti-utilitarian. So the idea that he is a utilitarian, it just makes no sense. It's like saying that, it's like trying to force all of economics into a single philosophy when in fact it's, it's designed by its nature to be neutral with respect to those kinds of commitments. Now, here there's an important difference between consequences and consequentialism. Yes, yes, yes. The philosophers say that utilitarianism is a form of consequentialism. And it's the specific form of consequentialism in which the consequences that matter with respect to the rightness and wrongness of our action are the effects on utility. That's the core utilitarian belief. It's that form of consequentialism. Law and economics is very much about consequences, but it's not necessarily consequentialist. It's, yes. not, it's not dedicated to a consequentialist philosophy, like Posner is not committed to a consequentialist philosophy. I myself was a student of John Rawls, a man whom I deeply admired and loved. 
And if you ask me, what is my philosophy? I'm not sure I have a philosophy, but maybe the answer would be Rawlsian. Certainly. So, meaning thereby, you don't, uh, you don't want to put uh, that uh, discipline in one set of philosophy. Rather, you, you, you want to have to an understanding and inspiration from every available uh, philosophy, which can which can have a better predictive results to have better yes. growth. That's what you are trying to make out the case for law and economics. Now, let me relate that to the problem of being a lawyer. All right. So economics is usually divided into positive economics and normative economics. And positive economics uh, tries to uh, characterize uh, how people will respond to incentives. Especially uses the notion of maximization and equilibrium. Right? That's positive economics. Yes. And normative economics evaluates the interactions of people, especially it compares equilibria according to how efficient they are. So the positive and the normative are the two, said to be two branches of, act, of, e economics. of economics. economics. Very often studies combine both of these branches, but uh, this is the way the subject is divided up in people's minds and in people's uh, and in teaching. But the first question of law and economics, excuse me, the first question of law, the first question that a lawyer asks is not what are the effects of a law or is the law good or bad with respect to um, the well-being of people. No, that's not, those aren't the first, the first question is what is the law? Yeah, that is the, that, 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 what that, does the, the law require of us? That, that is the ordinarily in philosophical school, what is the law and uh, what it requires is the question, question we address upon. Yes, so when, a, when you take the bar exam, you don't have to know uh, positive or normative economics. You have to know what the law is. What the law is. Now, economists have a hard time understanding what it means to know what the law is. When I first studied, started studying law, I couldn't figure it out. I thought law, what does it mean to know the law? I guess that what means that, that means is you've memorized a lot of rules and you've organized them real well, so you can recall what they are. You see, see, I had no idea what legal reasoning was. The whole point is that the law is not self-interpretive. It doesn't interpret itself. You may remember, you may know, you may memorize what the rule is, but the rule is going to be abstract. And when it confronts a case, the rule has got to be interpreted in light of the factual situation of the case. And that involves legal reasoning. It's not self-evident from the reading of the rule itself. So that activity of saying what the law is, is especially the activity of interpreting. A phenomenon, the, a logical, rational, rational. rational. Well, it's rational, but it's interesting. It's not simply deductive in the way math is. You see, the the ideal of mathematics is if you if if uh, if a implies b and b implies c, then a implies c. Did you did deduce deduce the things? You deduce the thing. Deduce right. the things. Yes. So that's the law of transitivity. And transitivity. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, Legal proofs aren't like that. It, it's not so much that A implies B and B implies C. It's more like if A is true, it's more likely that B is true. And if B is true, it's more likely that C is true. But if A is true, you can't be confident that C is true. That's because, That's because the law, legal law follows a logic, but it's a different logic. It's a logic in which arguments have weight. You see, in a mathematical proof, every step is equally important in the sense that if one step is wrong, the whole proof is wrong. Proof is wrong. Uh, and that's because it consists of necessary and sufficient conditions. But uh, legal proof, is not, that's not the case, because some arguments in the proof, some steps in the proof, are more important than others. They have more weight. And even though you may have made a mistake at some point in the proof, the weight 
may be such that still your conclusion was right. So it's having a feel for that looser use of language, that use of looser connection of one concept to another, that's part, the great part of what legal reasoning is. So it's, you, you would, uh, if I'm not correct, uh, if, if I'm not wrong, and if I'm wrong, then correct me, uh, because uh, this is very important, you, how you see mathematics and law and economics and law. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the case where the Kelsen uh, said that the law and there's a distinction between science and law and the mm -hmm. common common uh, that uh, mm -hmm. if if x happens then y will uh, happen. Yeah, this is how he puts it. Yeah, and when you deduce uh, or induce induce or deduce in the mathematical uh, sense, so uh, the legal analysis is uh, somehow. Uh, linguistic barrier in interpretation where you lose some sort of a uh, correct rational and economic analysis gives a better finding that's what you, you, case you want to make well uh, first of all it may be useful to relate this discussion to the philosophy of language one of the uh, great uh, developments in the 20th century was the philosophy of Wit Wittgenstein. Yes. And uh, Wittgenstein thought that the, that in a language, the concepts in a language do not relate to each other mathematically or as necessary in sufficient conditions. He thought they connected by what he called criteria. And criteria are family resemblances. So that if you have, you might have, say, five criteria for using a word, and the more the criteria are satisfied, the more confident you are that the word is correctly applied. Yes, yes. But it's not the case that you ever have a complete picture. Complete picture. You complete know, picture, that's what he says. It's, in <laughs> it's not a closed set. Uh -huh. And that's the form of reasoning that lawyers are engaging in. Now, in that form of reasoning, it turns out to be very helpful to have uh, some formal models. Uh, what economists would say, you stylize the facts, is to say you, you sort of purify or the facts uh, so they're not as com complicated as the world really is. Max Weber called this an ideal type. Ideal type. Economists say a stylization of the facts. Mm -hmm. Lawyers sometimes say it's a hypothetical. So you, you simplify a complicated reality, stylize the facts, and then you see what the logical consequences are of that stylization. And you understand that that stylization is going to reach, you, enable you to reason to a remote conclusion. And it's not necessarily going to have hold in life, because the stylization lays out too many facts. But when you have the formalization, you almost always learn a lot about what that concept is. You don't end up with a necessary and sufficient condition. You don't reduce deciding a case to mathematics. You know, a proof in the court of law is never going to be a theorem in mathematics. It's, yes, not, exactly. the, it's, not, it's not going to be that way. Uh, exactly. But if you have some of those formal models, you can see much better what the consequences are likely to be of, say, a particular interpretation of the law. Great, great. great. Now, and, and here in law and economics goes. Oh, yeah. This is, law and economics follows what I have recently come to uh, call uh, the, uh, the, 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 the law and economics principle of interpretation, uh, which is this, that laws have purposes. Yes, Some ob objective they keep, the objective they keep. They, say they have purposes. When, the, when you interpret the law, it often has to be interpreted in light of its purpose. That's not always the case. Sometimes Sometimes the, the rule says uh, you, you, this document has to have a signature, your signature and a date, 
on it or it's not a good document. And then you say, what's the purpose of that? Well, there's probably a lot of different purposes. I don't know, but that's the rule. You've got to sign it and you've got to date it or it's not a, it's not a good contract. Sometimes the law has, has, sometimes there are rules in the law that don't have uh, any clear or certain purpose, but have a lot of purposes. However, what happens in law is that when you have faced with the problem of interpretation, in a hard case, and by a hard case, I mean one in which there is uh, no mechanical application of the rule that will give you the result. All right? Kind of like, like, okay, well, let me give you an example. This is a, an example from, uh, from Hart, actually. Suppose that you have a uh, park and you have a rule that in the park no motor vehicles are allowed. Okay? So everybody understands that means you can't drive your car through the park. Okay? But suppose that the people who, ha who are maintain the park want to put, say, a, a memorial to the soldiers of a great battle. Can they put a tank from the battle in the park? Tank's a motor vehicle. Right? The rule says, no, you know motor vehicles in the park. But almost everybody's going to say, but that surely doesn't mean you can't put the, the tank, memorial tank. in the, yeah, the tank tank's, is a park. tank is a memorial, you can put the memorial in the park. Okay, so the point is, when the tank comes up, there is, um, that's a lot, that's a lot harder case than whether you can drive your car down the, uh, uh, down the, uh, down this, the, uh, the park lane. Okay. Let's take an even harder case. Can a child drive a toy car down the park, down the park, down through the park? Is that allowed? That's a, that's a harder case. Well, as the case gets harder, usually what you do to try to interpret the law and find out what it requires of you, remember, the question is, first question of the law is, what does the law require of you? The first thing, you know, what you have to do when answering that first question, in a hard case, what you usually do is you refer to the purposes of the law. Say, why? what was the point of this law? And then you say, which interpretation is the best one? Is the, is best suited one. The best, that's, which one will satisfy the purposes of the best? Okay? And if, the, if you think the main purpose of the prohibiting motor vehicles in the, car, in the park is so that people won't be disturbed or bothered or endangered, then I think you have a pretty good basis for deciding the case. Now, in general, notice what you have to do is to ask what will be the consequences of the alternative interpretations. For example, if you put the tank in the park as a memorial, will that tank make noise and disturb people? Okay, well, what about the toy car? What about the child driving the the electric toy car, will that disturb and bother people? You have to predict what the consequences are. Now, a great thing about law and economics is it enables you to predict things based on the incentives that the law creates. Law creates incentives. It creates incentives uh, in the in the British analytical tradition, uh, ma many laws are described as obligations backed by sanctions. Yes. And the sanction creates an incentive to do or not to do what the obligation is. Okay? True, true. So the law is at its core a set of incentives. And economics is wonderful at predicting the effects of what those incentives will be in situations where it's not easy to figure it out. Yes, agreed. And it's, it's, it's useful in two ways. One way is it's useful just a priori reasoning. If you're the judge sitting there, you don't have any statistics, you don't have any numbers, still you can often think through the case by incentive effects. You can think, say, will this interpretation of the tax law cause industry to, to, to invest more or less? You can ask questions like that, even without the data, and it also the law in economics points you towards the data that you need.
to really do a good job. Most law cases you're going to be decided without data. You don't have time for that. They've got to be done. Here it is. Here's the case. Or maybe the incentive effects are so big. There's so many big effects. You don't. It's kind of like climbing a mountain. You know, eventually you run out of oxygen. Well, sooner or later you run out of the facts, and you you just have to make a guess. But the incentive effects will often be a great guide to you. So, the principle of interpretation uh, in law and economics is that the best interpretation of the law is the interpretation that yields the best effects, that has the best consequences, consequences. relative to the purposes <coughs> of, the, of the law itself. It's, some people think that all the laws about efficiency. I'm sure it is. Sorry to interrupt you, yeah. Professor. One one thing is interesting coming to my mind, which we have this. You told me all that. You um, that may be an idea of your new project also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to ask that uh, efficiency and incentive. Mm -hmm. uh, they are they are head to head collusion on the thoughts uh, that saying that a lot of. Uh, People, scholars are critical about the efficiency criteria, mm -hmm. particularly law and constitution. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is another thought which you, uh, which, which you, you profess must um, much uh, that uh, incentive criteria. Mm -hmm. How you see the picture in terms of constitutionalism mm -hmm. across the border uh, of the countries? Like here, here in uh, America, we have a federal structure. And uh, it is somewhat similar to the India is the case, which is this, uh, with some some uh, similarity, large larger the cases. In Europe, there is a different case altogether. And since law and economics is having one language across the border line, uh, how you see the con uh, efficiency, incentive, and the constitutional structures? Oh, wonderful question. Um, all right. Uh, there are some constitutional provisions in which the law states its own purpose and states it in a narrow way. Uh, a very important one to me that relates to Solomon's Knot is the law concerning intellectual property. In the American Constitution, the central government, the federal government, is explicitly given the power to create intellectual property law. And that's um, a preemptive power in the sense that when the federal government ex exercises that power, it preempts any other state law. Any law of the 50 states will be preempted and replaced by the federal law where the federal law has been enacted. And the uh, provision of the Constitution that gives the federal government the power to create intellectual property law says that its purpose is for progress in the useful arts. That's the language. That's it. Now, progress in the useful arts is just 18th century words for what we would now call innovation. It's practical innovation. True. So, there it is, a clear economic goal, the goal that I think is most important in the Solomon's Knot to the wealth of nations, uh, to the prosperity of people, to solving poverty. Um, I think that goal of uh, practical innovation is uh, the, the, the most important legal aim to solve poverty and to increase the wealth of nations. There it is in the Constitution. It's not, it's, it's an invitation to do law and economics. It's an invitation to say whether is if this interpretation of the law or that interpretation of the law, which one is correct? Well, the one that's going to create faster economic innovation. Uh, so, for example, uh, no one knows yet what the optimal patent length is. And by the optimal patent length, I mean the length of the duration of a patent that would maximize the rate of economic innovation. In Germany, they have minor patents and major patents, and they are of different length. Indeed. In America and many other countries, they have only one patent. It's 20 years. 
in America it used to be 18 years, now it's 20 years. And still there are ambiguities that require interpretation. You might think 20 years, that's it, but you know, then there's always the question, well, exactly when does it begin? When do you, when do you start counting? Um, then, of course, there's exceptions. There's all these exceptions where they say, oh, well, it ran for 10 years, but then it was, a, then it was a suspended for a little while and it started up again. So these are hard problems of interpretation. They require legal reasoning. And how should they be decided? Well, I think the correct decision is the one that maximizes the rate of economic innovation. If a little bit longer patent length on a prescription drug is going to lead to faster innovation in prescription drugs, then I think the correct interpretation is the one that makes it a little longer. So that's an example of the incentive principle of interpretation, which is that when the law has a definite purpose, the correct interpretation of it is usually the one that satisfies that purpose the best or the most fully. Okay. But, uh, but, but I do want to say there are many areas in the law, in the Constitution, where the purpose is not explicitly given or that narrow. For example, much of the American Constitution is about liberty. It's a wider horizon. It's a, yeah, liberty, what is liberty? Well, that's a term like justice <laughs> and like efficiency. It's, it's kind of vague and it needs a lot. The, ter the concept itself needs a lot of interpretation. And, that's something law and economics can do too, but it's harder. It's much harder than pick, predicting growth rates from alternative interpretations of the IP law. And to making choices among them. Yeah, that's harder. That's hard. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll take uh, two questions. Yeah. One is uh, related to my country, India, by yeah. which we'll conclude this discussion. Okay. And uh, proceed uh, to that. Yeah. Uh, one important question which comes out of this discussion. This is a harder case to do law in economics in a much horizon, long horizon of uh, constitutional, uh, uh, Dr. Reinald saying, in terms of equality, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, liberties, mm -hmm. and they, they are always subject to the varied interpretation, mm -hmm. and the uh, problem of choice comes in. So mm -hmm. in economics we have rational choice theories, public mm -hmm. choice theories, and other choice theories uh, uh, which uh, the constitution of economics is also applies to an extent. And game theories also there is uh, making mm -hmm. rational uh, decisions in a state of conflicts. And that is very all fine. Uh, we can apply law in economics in a, in a, in a suggestion to policymakers, uh, suggestions, uh, recommendations to the legislature when they make a rule but once the rule is fixed and man lend it up in a problem and it goes to the court to decide one way or the other way what is the uh, utopianly called justice uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, which health council said uh, and it is an emotive idea mm -hmm. and uh, Amartya Sen said that, that, uh, that don't think about that emotive idea Think about the, how can you you can reduce the injustice, and uh, Rawl has its his own uh, lifting of well basic structures and that ideas. So how you see that entire phenomena of learning mm -hmm. in law and economics uh, uh, travel to the in suggestion in policy makings, uh, legislation making, uh, and, and next step is to influence this scholarship to the judges in the mm -hmm. court. Mm -hmm. uh, where they can look for a, a rational of economic analysis of law to decide their cases. Um, I'm for sure that many countries, many countries, many judges applied, but that number is not that welcoming. Yeah. And uh, much, uh, much a uh, greater task is to be done in relation to the court practices. And how you see in posterity that law and economics will take it to the seriously in a productive work. The judges can say, okay, fine enough in a constitutional court, we, we, we have this learning and we are benefited from it. Yes. Well, one of the great uh, features of the modern world is the availability of education to many more people. And the availability of education to many more people permits us to, to enter into and to create and sustain an intellectual culture. And of course, I love ideas for their own sake. Uh, and I love a society 
in which people take ideas seriously, in which they argue about them and they, they debate about them uh, because they care. Uh, you know, there's a certain uh, ideas, good ideas, it's like, uh, it's like uh, uh, a beautiful marriage uh, because there's always more. Well, there's always something more there. And that's the way it is with great ideas. Now, the law exists in an intellectual culture. Yes. It exists as part of an intellectual tradition that begins with basic skills of literacy, with teaching children to read, to write, and to argue. To right. argue is to think. Uh, so the existence of that intellectual culture then helps to create a particular legal culture. And the legal culture is, depends on history, depends on a lot of things. The first goal of law and economics is to establish itself in the legal culture. It should become a part of the core ideas that people who, end, who are educated in the law simply know. You just need to know these things. And the next step then is that it should actually influence the interpretation of the law. The interpretation of the law and the making of the law. Making of the law through interpretation and making of the law through legislation or other means through regulations. And uh, I have had the pleasure of seeing the intellectual culture of law and economics deepen and spread in my own country and around the world. Um, to me, it makes the discussion of the law from a theoretical point of view so much more interesting than the kinds of theories that preceded it. For example, Guido Calabresi is one of the founders of our subject, and he wrote a book in the 1970s called The Cost of Accidents. I one of the classic questions in, in tort law is uh, whether it's better to have a rule of strict liability or a rule of negligence. And honestly, when I read all the discussions of that before Guido Calabretti's book, I just like it gives me a headache. It's around and around and around and I don't seem to get anywhere. And then I read Guido Calabresi's book and there it is. He's got the foundational distinction between strict liability and negligence right. And from then on, the law and economics develops that distinction in a way that I think is always interesting and often Just compelling. So that's a process that I see at work in some countries. I don't quite know why it works well in some countries and not others. People who don't know much about law and economics sometimes say, well, it's a, it's a common law subject and not a civil law subject. I think that's completely wrong. I think law and economics is stronger in Germany than it is in England. Exactly. That, that's so, what I also feel. And that's what Forschefer has done a lot. Yeah, well, that, sometimes it's a great man, it's, but yeah. it's a great man in the right situation. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I, I don't... Uh, I hope that uh, India, which has a deep intellectual culture, a wonderful intellectual culture, and I might say the uh, mastery of the masters of the English language now live in India. Exactly, true enough. So it's, a, it's not only an intellectual culture, a lot of it's in the English language, which really helps us law and economic scholars. To be yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll end up this, this important discussion with a very reference to question to my country, that is yeah. India. Uh, India is a uh, very, uh, de very fastest developing country. Indeed. And uh, a big, uh, largest, one of the largest democracy as, as we cherish in uh, yes. America. And uh, the growth story is, uh, for India is phenomenal in the last 20-30 uh, days. But uh, India uh, in the law and in the growing economy story is facing a lot of uh, trouble uh, 
in the litigation is litigations and interpretation by the constitutional rational and uh, uh, the startups startups small and big startups uh, innovations are there and uh, I know that you read a lot and know a lot about the Indian uh, issues how you see in the Indian phenomena and uh, why we cannot uh, be without law and economics there yes. and uh, we have to take this on in India in a much faster way in another one decade to, to yeah. go ahead uh, how you see it and uh, how you perceive it and what may be the important task which can be taken up as a project in India yeah. to in law and economics to better off the legal and scholarship there. So I really want to uh, learn and understand from yeah. this living legend which is very <laughs> important uh, and precious for us. Well, well that's a wonderful question because it takes us back to the very beginning yeah. about Solomon's Knot, yes. about the the ideas and the money being joined together to create innovation and growth. And I think that it's the characteristic of innovation and growth, which is, which is deep and sustaining, um, that it is decentralized. That is to say, it draws upon the creativity of lots and lots of different people who are given freedom in the economic sphere. Um, and in order for them to exercise that freedom and that creativity, they need a legal structure. Without a legal structure, particularly uh, the, the uh, property, contracts, and business organizations, it's very difficult for people with new ideas and people with money to cooperate together. Now, I think that it's natural, a natural characteristic of legal training to think in an anti-decentralized way, to think in a centralized way. Okay. It, it's partly um, goes back to a discussion you and I had uh, uh, before before this interview about uh, Hans Kelsen. And yes, yes. Whether there's a fundamental norm or a fundamental law when, from which everything is derived. See, some people have in their mind that law is like the army. You know, there's some top authority and then there's all the other authorities that all are subordinate under it. No, well, the law of innovation is not like that. It's not in the army that you free up the individual and creative capacities of people. The army is an absolutely necessary institution for the defense of your society, but it doesn't produce you economic growth. And I think that a change in the attitude towards the law, the understanding of the law, that the India is having this fantastic economic growth based upon innovation of a of a uh, some of it of a most impressive technological kind, and that requires an understanding of law as an instrument for the decentralized decentralized cooperation of people with each other, and the best way for the judiciary for the lawmakers and the uh, lawyers to get that idea of how the decentralized law works is through law and economics. Remember, a law and e economists, the market is a decentralized system of allocation and all economists just know that, know that in the core of their being. Okay, so, so you, you, you see a great future for law and economics in the largest democracy in, in, around the world. Future, which is, which is, should be another ten, uh, one, one or two, three, four decades. Well, uh, well, I hope so. And what I know is this: if there are ten more like you, it will have a great future. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to hear this. Uh, but I must, uh, I must say that the foundation is led by you people, <laughs> <laughs> like and uh, we, are, we, we, we have make an effort to make a monument upon that. But uh, in the foundation, I can, I can see that people like uh, Kose, Uta. Becker and uh, Postner. Uh, this is the generation which uh, which we really, which we will cherish, and it's a really wonderful experience to have a conversation with you, Professor Robert Kutcher, and uh, we play we, we we pray that uh, many more books and intellectual work on law and economics will see in 
another one decade from you and learn more. Uh, God willing, I'll see you in India. Oh, uh, we love to be. Uh, I, I, from here, I make a make an invitation to living legend Professor Cooter, Robert Cooter, to uh, welcome uh, to India, and uh, you will be our special guest, cherished guest there. So, ladies and gentlemen, wonderful. It was nice talking with Robert Kutcher, uh, who is one of the leading pioneer in the field of law and economics with many, many celebrated book. And it was a privileged moment to have a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very thank nice. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. That was fun.